order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Caroline Flint. Question number one, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Mr Damien Green. <laughs> Mr. Mr Speaker, I have been asked to reply. My right hon. Friend the Prime Minister is in attendance on Her Majesty the Queen, welcoming Their Majesties King Felipe and Queen Letitia of Spain on their state visit to the United Kingdom. I am sure the whole House wishes them well. Caroline Flint. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Isn't today's report that National Grid made £3 billion profit in 2015-16 at the expense of households further evidence that the government is not delivering fair energy prices? Will the government agree to an immediate rebate for overcharging and will the government now commit to an energy price cap for the 70 million households on the most expensive tariffs? The, the Right Honourable Lady is right to identify the issue of energy prices, and I am sure she will welcome the announcement in the Queen's speech that the Government will ensure fairer markets for consumers, and that this will include bringing forward measures to help tackle unfair practices in the energy market to help reduce energy bills. I am sure this is an issue on which we can work across the House together. Jeremy Lefoy. Yeah. Mr Speaker, yesterday you kindly hosted two important talks on the future of health and social care and their funding, including one by my honourable friend for Totnes. My right honourable friend knows that the NHS in Staffordshire and Stoke is delivering fine care, but under great financial pressure in common with other parts of the country. Can I encourage the Government to bring together people from across this House to make this Parliament the one which puts the NHS and social care on a firm and sustainable foundation? Uh, I'm uh, grateful to my honourable friend, and I know he's been uh, campaigning vigorously on behalf of uh, health service in his constituency, uh, including his local hospital, and he's absolutely right to do so. He and I, I'm sure, both welcome the fact uh, that the government has committed an extra £8 billion over this parliament to the NHS, and we're also committed to having a full debate uh, across the House and, indeed, much wider with people about how we can improve our social care system, because this is, indeed, one of the big issues facing this country. Emily Thorne. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Let me welcome the First Secretary to his new role. By my reckoning, in the 20 years since he first joined this House, he is the 16th member of the party opposite uh, to uh, to be represented at Prime Minister's Questions. So how about I give him until the end of this session to be able to name all the others? Um, (laughs) In the meantime, I'm I'm sure that that, uh, he and the whole House will join me in congratulating Joe Conter and the British and Irish Lions on their historic achievement of recent days. Mr Speaker, um, on the subject of British and Irish cooperation, the First Secretary has huge expertise on the practicalities of the common travel area. On that basis, can he tell the House what will happen to the Irish land border if no deal is reached between Britain and Europe by the end of March 2019? Um, I am grateful to the uh, Right Honourable Lady for her kind remarks. Uh, I might take up her offer to try and name uh, all 16 in the tea room later, uh, rather than delay the House now. Uh, There are many, many distinguished people uh, of both sexes who have done it in this party, because we, of course, uh, elect women leaders uh, occasionally. I am also... I also absolutely, uh, absolutely share her view about the uh, British and Irish Lions, uh, though it, it strikes me as a particularly British thing to do to celebrate a drawn series uh, quite as hard uh, as we have. But nevertheless, that's the way we do sport. Uh, and indeed, you, I know, Mr Speaker, uh, will be very keen on following uh, Joe Conter's progress uh, through Wimbledon, as well as Andy Murray. Uh, Let's hope we have two finalists uh, over the weekend. Uh, on, the, on the substantive question she asks uh, about the Irish border, uh, she will know that uh, it is the aim of this government to make sure that we get the best deal for Britain. And as the Prime Minister set out in her Lancaster House speech, one of the key issues which we want to bring forward and have brought forward at the start of the negotiations is precisely the issue of the Irish border, because it is extremely important not just for uh, our own citizens 
in Northern Ireland, but for the Irish Republic, uh, that we get that right. Uh, and indeed, uh, I have already had meetings with my opposite number, the Tornushtu, uh, on this matter and other matters. Yeah. Emily Thornberry. Yeah, I mentioned at the outset that he's a 16th member to represent his party in Prime Minister's questions since 1997. Of uh, only three of those have been women, and the last one before the current Prime Minister was 16 years ago. I believe we've had three women Labour MPs doing this job in the last two years alone. But if I may turn to the next question, my question was not what deal do we hope to get. My, deal was not, my question was not what deal do we hope to get, but what happens if we get no deal at all? This isn't some sinister nightmare dreamt up by Remainers. It was the Prime Minister who first floated the idea of no deal, the Foreign Secretary who said it would be perfectly OK, the Brexit Secretary who said that we would be prepared to walk away. But since the election, the Chancellor has said that that would be a very, very bad outcome, and a former minister has told Sky News that no deal is dead. So will the, will the First Secretary clear this up? Are ministers just making it up as they're going along? Or, or is it still the government's clear policy that no deal is an option? The, uh, the, the, uh, I recommend the right honourable lady read the Prime Minister's Lancaster House speech. That is the basis uh, on which we're negotiating. But we're also saying that it is conceivable that we would be offered a kind of punishment deal that would be worse than no deal. It is not our intention. We want to have a deal. We want to have a good deal. Can I also point out to her that it is her leader and her party's position that whatever is on offer, they will accept it. That is a terrible way. That is a terrible way to go into a negotiation. And all I can congratulate them on is their consistency. They have been consistently in favour of unilateral disarmament. They, they don't only apply that in military matters, they clearly apply it in matters of negotiation on Britain's future prosperity as well. Emily Thornberry. Well, the First Secretary apparently didn't get the Prime Minister's memo. You're supposed to be building consensus, man. And if... <laughs> political bluster and if we ignore the political bluster I think what we heard was that no deal is indeed still an option and if that is the case can we turn to what I might call the East India Club question because before the member for Newton Abbott suddenly turned herself into Nick Griffin this was the question that she was trying to ask what does no deal actually mean for our businesses, for our people, and for issues such as the Irish land border. So, can the First Secretary address this question now? What does no deal look like in practice? I'm very happy to uh, address her first point about consensus. I'm always, as you know, uh, a moderate person keen on consensus, and so I very much look forward uh, to sharing the Labour Party's views this morning on the unemployment figures. Uh, Unemployment, unemployment is now down to its lowest level since the early 70s. There are many members of this House who weren't born when unemployment was as low as this government has made it. Uh, I would hope uh, that she can bring herself, in the course of her questions, actually to welcome lower unemployment. On the substance of her question, as she knows, we are seeking a good deal for Britain that will enable us to trade as freely as possible with the European Union to protect our prosperity, at the same time as getting trade deals with other important markets around the world. In the last week alone, both the United States and Australia have said they would like to sign trade deals with Britain as fast as possible. So I'm happy to report to her that negotiations are going well and that her fear of no deal is probably overstated. If he wants to talk about if he wants to talk about if he wants to talk about unemployment, let me ask him specifically. Will he publish the Treasury's assessment of the impact of what of the no deal outcome would have on jobs and growth in Britain? Will he publish that today? I didn't think so. So let's continue. So if the First Secretary won't tell the House 
what no uh, order the honourable lady must be heard and she will be as will first secretary green members must calm themselves emily thornbury much, Mr. Speaker. If the First Secretary won't tell the House what no deal means, can he at least clear up the confusion over whether a plan for no deal actually exists? Because yesterday the Foreign Secretary told me that indeed no, no, there was no plan for no deal. Two hours later, Number 10 fought back and they said there was a plan. The Brexit Secretary might be laughing, but I'm turning to him next because the Brexit. <laughs> The Brexit Secretary was so busy fighting with himself that on March the 12th he said that there, that there was a plan. On March the 17th he said that there wasn't. On, Mar- on May the 19th he said he spent half his time thinking about it. And yesterday he said that he wasn't prepared to comment. So, can the First Secretary clear up the confusion today? Is there a contingency plan for no deal or isn't there? And if there is, will he undertake to publish it? The, um, the, hon- the Honourable Lady says she's happy to talk about unemployment. I notice she can't bring herself to welcome falling unemployment figures. We will, we, will, we, will, we, will, we will clearly have to try harder to establish consensus on what I would hope would be something that genuinely unites all sides of this House. Uh, on the issue of uh, the report, the uh, OBR is publishing its fiscal risks report tomorrow. So if she can be patient, she will see the report she wants. <laughs> Emily Thornbury. So let's be clear. The First Secretary seems to be saying that no deal is still on the table, but he won't say what it means. That, and, there is, and there is a no deal contingency plan, but he, he is not going to publish it. This really is two steps forward and two steps back. After all, if the government seriously wants open cross-party debate about the best way forward for Brexit, surely they, can, they have to spell out what all the options look like. So can the First Secretary at least provide some clarity on one issue, and let's try and make some progress today? He has said repeatedly that we want to avoid a cliff-edge Brexit. But under a no-deal scenario, he knows that that must be impossible because the Prime Minister can hardly storm out of the negotiating room saying that she won't accept the deal and then pop her head round the door again and say, can she have two more years to prepare? Because that's not how it works. So does he accept no deal also means no transitional arrangements? Let me try even harder to establish consensus with the Right Honourable Lady. I think we both want a deal. I hope, I hope she will agree to that, that she wants a deal at the end of this. And the reason why I am optimistic that because of, of our negotiating stance and the position set out by the Prime Minister, we will get a deal, is that we have, for example, made a fair and realistic offer about citizenship to try and remove that problem from the equations. That that is a first indication of how we will approach these negotiations. We approach them in a positive state, and we believe that it is the, not just in the interests of Great Britain, but also in the interests of the other member states of the European Union to reach a deal with what is their, one of their biggest trading partners. So it is in everyone's interest to reach this deal, and uh, frankly, she said nothing constructive that might contribute to a deal so far, but I will give her another chance. I know the right honourable gentleman is new to this, but the way the rules work. Order, order, order. Uh, order. I don't know whether it's spontaneous or orchestrated, and I don't really care which, but whichever it is, the idea that it's going to stop the honourable lady asking her questions is for the birds. So members are wasting their vocal cords. We will carry on as long as necessary to accommodate the backbench members whom I wish to accommodate. Emily Thornbury. Yeah, I know that the uh, honourable member is new to this, but the but the way that it works is he asks the, he, the I ask the questions and he answers them. And we're quite happy. I'm quite happy to we're quite happy to, to swap places with them. And frankly, if he doesn't want to continue under these rules, I'm sure there's plenty of other people on the front bench there who'd love the opportunity to audition as prime minister. But I. I do appreciate. I do appreciate all the first secretary's answers, uh, 
uh, but they do just serve to illustrate what a mess the government has got itself into by threatening to walk away even before talks began. Isn't the truth now that we've got a no-deal option on the table, but they won't tell us what that means? They've got contingency plans, but they won't let the public see them. We've got a Chancellor demanding transitional arrangements, which a no-deal option makes impossible. We've got a Foreign Secretary making it up as he's going along. We've got a Brexit Secretary so used to overruling his colleagues that he's started overruling himself. And we've got a Prime Minister who's so bereft of ideas that she's started putting suggestion boxes around Parliament. <laughs> but as a country, as a country, we have got 20 months to go until Brexit. We absolutely have got to get a grip. And if the party opposite hasn't got the strength for the task, then we've absolutely got to get rid of them. I think, I think there may have been a question somewhere in that. Can I assure the Right Honourable Lady uh, of two things? First of all, that this government is already in the negotiations. She will have seen that. We have started negotiations. They are going well. We said that the first thing we wanted to do was negotiate citizens' rights. That was the first item on the agenda of the first meeting. We want to make sure that uh, European citizens in this country and, equally importantly, British citizens living in other European countries have as much certainty about their rights as soon as possible. That is what we are negotiating. That is the sign of a practical, pragmatic government getting on with work in the interests of the British people. What we would have, as we've seen from the Labour Party, they've so far, I've counted, had nine different plans uh, on Europe. They want to be both in and out of the single market, in and out of the customs union. Uh, they said they wanted to remain. They voted uh, for Article 50. They split their party on that. And she made one point about whether she would prefer to be uh, at this dispatch box rather than at that dispatch box. I would also remind her of the other event that's happened recently where the Conservative Party got more votes and more seats than the Labour Party and won the election. David Morris! Oh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I do welcome the jobs that have been announced. Yeah. And furthermore, Mr Speaker, after 65 years in my constituents, if talking about a link road, one actually occurred on my watch. And furthermore, there's an enterprise zone stroke business park that I'm trying to attain, and we've had a very productive meeting with the powerhouse minister yesterday, and also the first minister of the Isle of Man, who I do believe is here today. And would my right honourable friend help in any way possible to ensure that this business park does become a reality to create more jobs in Morecambe and Loonsdale? I agree with uh, my honourable friend. Uh, he'll be interested to know that in uh, the northwest of England, uh, employment has increased by 2.5% uh, over the past year, uh, and uh, the Labour benches may wish to welcome that rather than just heckle it. He's absolutely right to highlight the importance of having business parks and enterprise zones as drivers for uh, economic growth. Uh, I wish him well in his campaign, uh, and I'm sure my right honourable friend, the business secretary, would be happy to look into the matter. Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm sure the whole House would want to join with me and my colleagues in marking the 22nd anniversary of the sad events in Srebrenica and thank those that held the memorial last night in London to make sure that we never forget. Uh, Mr Speaker, will the First Secretary of State confirm that the devolved administrations will not face a diminution of powers as a result of the repeal bill? Yeah. I, uh, I, I join the uh, honourable gentleman in, in commemorating the dreadful events uh, at Srebrenica, uh, and I am happy to uh, reconfirm uh, what my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, and others have said: that yes, uh, under the, the terms of the Brexit deal that we will negotiate, uh, that there will be no uh, diminution of the devolved administration's powers, and indeed that we look to devolve more powers as a result of this process. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the First Secretary of State for that answer. Will he confirm that there will be a cast iron guarantee that all powers that come back into the United Kingdom on devolved matters will be returned? And furthermore, 
Does the United Kingdom Government intend to amend Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act to change any aspect of the devolved competencies that were approved with the Scottish referendum in 1997? As, as I said, I can only keep uh, repeating the assurances uh, we've already given. I'm slightly surprised at the Scottish Nationalists' approach in that my understanding of their position is that they want the powers taken from London to Edinburgh so they can give them back to Brussels. I th- I th- I th- as I understand it, that's their position. Uh, but. Uh, Perhaps their inability to explain the logic of that position uh, might explain the recent general election result they have. Neil O'Brien! Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Earlier this year, a brilliant new hospital, St Luke's, opened in my constituency. But the old cottage hospital, which it replaces, contains an important and unique war memorial. Will the First Secretary agree with me that however the NHS redevelops that site, it's vital that that war memorial is preserved in a fitting way so that future generations can remember the sacrifices of those who came before us. I I think perhaps particularly at the moment when uh, we are about to commemorate the centenary of the terrible Battle of Passchendaele, uh, it's very important uh, that we consider the issues uh, of war memorials, memorials like the one he mentions, call on us to remember uh, the horrors of war and honour the memories uh, of those who died. Uh, In this case, I understand that the war memorial is protected by a historic England Grade 2 listing, and so specific planning consent would be required uh, to relocate the memorial as part of uh, any future plans. I hope that will provide the protection he and his constituents need. My constituent has serious mental ill health and has had over 50 separate admissions to psychiatric care. She requires regular monitoring to prevent her condition worsening and becoming a danger to herself and others. Now, she could access support under DLA, but stands to lose £110 per week under PIP. As former DWP Secretary of State, will he look urgently at this case and change the loophole in PIP that leaves very vulnerable people without the continual support that keeps them safe? Yeah. 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 Well, as, as, I, I mean, obviously, uh, the House will be concerned to hear about the, the case of her uh, constituent, as I am, and, and she will know that one of the effects of the transition from DLA to PIP is that more people are now eligible for support uh, that were uh, under support, particularly those, as it happens, with mental health problems. So, uh, but the, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions will have heard uh, her point, and I've, I've no doubt if she contacts him, he will look into the case personally. Kit Malthouse. Mr. Spe- yeah. Mr. Speaker, some of the most distressing cases that I and other members see in my constituency surgery are those involving domestic violence. Uh, the Queen's speech has promised a bill to help strengthen our confrontation of this problem. So I wonder if the Deputy Prime Minister, First Secretary, sorry, could uh, tell us when we can expect this legislation. Uh, urgently needed as it is, and what the government is doing about this problem while we await it. Well, I agree. This is a, a, a hugely uh, important issue, and, and he's right. Uh, we've committed in the Queen's speech to introduce a domestic abuse bill uh, in this session, which I hope will be uh, a landmark in this very uh, important area. He, he, what we want to do in the bill is set in motion um, a transformation uh, not just to protect and support victims, but to recognise the lifelong impact domestic abuse uh, can have on children uh, and to make sure that the agencies respond effectively to uh, domestic abuse. We'll, of course, be consulting with uh, all the uh, relevant professions and voluntary groups uh, on this, but we are absolutely determined to press ahead with this very, very important legislation. Jarvis. Little Max Johnson is nine. He's in hospital and he's urgently waiting for a heart transplant. His mum, Emma, and his brother, Harry, join us today to support Max, but also the 10,000 people around the country who need an organ transplant. We can do more to help them. In Wales, they've already moved to the opt-out system, and Scotland plan to do the same. So can the First Secretary of State say whether he agrees with me that in England we should change the law to one of presumed consent for organ donation to give Max and all those other people the best chance of life? I'm I'm sure that the uh, thoughts of members across the House are, are with Max. Uh, and his family at this incredibly uh, difficult time. And and I agree with him that organ donation uh, is clearly a hugely important part uh, of our system. And I'm pleased that there are now more than 23 million uh, organ donor, people on the organ donor uh, register. And over the past year, we saw the highest ever 
uh, donor and transport rates uh, in the UK. But of course, uh, there is more that uh, can be done, and, and as he says, uh, the law is different in, in other uh, territories inside the UK. Uh, and absolutely, I can commit the Department of Health is looking uh, at the impact of those changes to see if days can give rise to further improvements in the uh, number of available organs we have. Mr. Graham Brady. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, is my friend aware that the Greater Manchester Chambers quarterly economic survey? Uh, predicts economic growth at three and a quarter percent annually, as it has been broadly since 2013. Is he further aware that Manchester Airport is planning a billion pound investment uh, in the coming years? Doesn't this indicate a welcome rebalancing of the economy, uh, underpinned by sound economic management? And will he undertake to continue that sound economic management that's so necessary to our country? My, my honourable friend makes uh, a number of, of, of important points, particularly about uh, Manchester Airport, which I know has been a significant driver of the excellent growth figures of the increasingly excellent uh, economy of Manchester and the surrounding areas. Uh, I, everything he says is true, and I think it is a tribute to the work that's been done on the Northern Powerhouse that we are now spreading that prosperity across the north of England. Dr. Rupa Huck. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The first secretary said the other day that we need to have a national debate on tuition fees, and he admitted that student debt is a huge issue. With the PM touting for ideas, can I recommend page 43 of our manifesto and ask that they, and ask that they adopt Labour's pledge to abolish tuition fees? No, I, I don't remember the contents of page 43, so I'd quite like to hear this. <laughs> that they consult page 43 of our manifesto and commit to Labour's policy of the abolition of tuition fees. I'm, I, I, it, 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 people often stand at this dispatch box and say, I'm, I'm pleased you raised that question. I'm genuinely pleased you raised that question. Because it allows me to point out the, the very slight problem with her argument, which is that her own education spokesman has admitted that the tuition fees policy has a 100 billion... She has admitted that there is a £100 billion hole, black hole, in Labour's student fees policy. That's as much money, nearly, as we spend on the NHS in a year. That's two years' worth of disability benefits. Labour in this area were particularly incredible at the general election. I'm astonished they want to bring it up at Prime Minister's questions. And I would remind them in particular that misleading students and young people is a very dangerous thing to do. If they don't believe me, they could ask the Liberal Democrats. Mr Speaker, just one in five of our public art sculptures and statues is of a woman. Next week, to mark 200 years since the death of the world-renowned novelist Jane Austen, the first ever sculpture of her will be unveiled in my constituency, Basingstoke, the borough of her birth, the county that inspired her. Will my right honourable friend join me in calling for more places to do what Basingstoke has and celebrate their famous daughters? I'm, I'm delighted to echo uh, my right honourable friend's uh, call to, to welcome this new statue of Jane Austen in Basingstoke. I'm genuinely astonished that there isn't a statue of Jane Austen uh, anywhere else uh, around the country. Uh, one of our, our greatest authors and, and still popular 200 years uh, since her birth. Uh, and I would be very, very happy also to uh, echo her desire to have uh, more statues of Britain's greatest women uh, spread around the country. Jamie Perkins. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Politicians are said to be here today and gone tomorrow, but whatever tomorrow may bring, the Prime Minister isn't even here today to mark the end of her first year in power. And I note for the first time since she's become Prime Minister that she... she I, I, listen, you might like to hear this. For the first time since she's become Prime Minister, her image has now been removed from the front page of the Conservative Party website. So... Can the, First Secretary, can the First Secretary tell us why she has gone from being the next Iron Lady to the Lady Vanishes? Um, 
the, the, the honourable gentleman is, uh, is ingenious in, in asking uh, very personal questions, and I commend him for it. Unfortunately, he has got his own record on this subject. As recently as June last year, uh, the honourable gentleman said that the, the leader of the Labour Party is not destined to become Prime Minister, and he called on him to resign. Uh, I suggest he might want to make peace with his own front bench before he starts being rude about ours. Uh, today's jobs figures show that we have the highest employment rate since comparable records began. Yeah. We, have, we have more people in full-time employment yep. and we are touching on the lowest youth unemployment since records began. Yeah. In light of the Matthew Taylor review and the modern working practices, what more can be done to ensure that this record continues and that low youth unemployment continues and we rid, rid this country of that scourge? Yeah. My, my honourable friend is, exa is exactly right, specifically on the subject of youth unemployment. One of the particularly welcome figures of the consistently low and falling unemployment exactly. figures over which this government has presided is the fact that youth unemployment is now at historically low levels and lower than many other comparable economies. We will continue this not just uh, with our moves on more apprenticeships in this parliament, but also with the introduction of new and better technical and vocational education, which is key to providing long-term prosperity, not just for the economy as a whole, but for everyone in this country. Yeah. Rosie yeah. Cooper. Yeah, yeah, thank, yeah, you, yeah. thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. How can the government continue to justify not providing fair and equitable funding arrangements for West Lancashire to support water level management organisation, otherwise known as drainage boards, um, to help protect homes and the agriculture and horticulture industries critical to the local economy, instead of causing EA to threaten to turn off the Alt Crossens pumping station. Uh, the uh, Honourable Lady raises uh, a reasonable point about the uh, Environment Agency. It is the Environment Agency's duty uh, to ensure that uh, water supplies are, are good and safe. Uh, and uh, I'm sure if she wishes to bring this issue up with my uh, right honourable friend, the uh, DEFRA Secretary, uh, he would be happy to talk to her about it. Andrew Salou. Uh, Zero energy bill homes at below market prices are being built by British architect Bill Dunster with the support of the building research establishment. Given their potential to help people find affordable housing, what more can the government do to help expand this type of housing as part of our commitment to both enterprise and social justice? Yeah. Well, I, I know my, my honourable friend is an energetic uh, campaigner for uh, social justice, and this is a very good example of how uh, having a dynamic and flexible economy is not just good for the economy, it's actually good for the whole of society. And uh, I'm happy to join him in welcoming uh, this type of innovation. It's a, the the uh, Bill Dunster's firm is a good example of such innovation, and I know that it's been supported by the government's enterprise investment scheme. So the government is doing its best to support uh, this type of measure, and we're stimulating the growth of the off-site construction sector, which enables more houses to be built through our accelerated construction programme and the Home Building Fund. This is uh, another very important issue to make sure that we spread the benefits of prosperity around this country. Tim Farron. Mr Speaker, I wonder if the First Secretary might imagine what it feels like to be a parent forced to uproot their children from their once settled home to flee war and persecution, as millions of refugees around the world have done. And then would he imagine further how it might feel for those who become separated from their family members, with one family member making it, for instance, to the United Kingdom, needlessly kept apart from their families due to cruel and unnecessary barriers to family reunification. So will the Government today endorse Baroness Hamwee's bill in the other place to bring those desperate families back together? Yeah. The, the Right Honourable Gentleman raises an important issue, and, and he will be aware 
uh, that uh, this government, this country, has done a huge amount, uh, particularly in the region, but also uh, here at home, to help refugees from uh, countries such as Syria. We've expanded the Vulnerable personal, uh, Persons Resettlement Scheme, uh, so we make sure our doors continue to remain open to people who most need our help. And in particular, we work very closely uh, with the UNHCR to identify and refer the most vulnerable refugees. That is the most sensible uh, humanitarian way we can help uh, these very desperate people. Uh, and can I also say, since I assume this is his last question, I suspect uh, as leader of his party, can I uh, wish him a fond farewell uh, from that job uh, and say that I'm delighted that the Liberal Democrats have taken so seriously uh, the government's fuller working life strategy, which is about uh, providing uh, more jobs for older workers and that they are about to, uh, to skip a generation in their leadership. Shailesh Bara. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At the recent G20 meetings, the Prime Minister had excellent and constructive trade discussions with the leaders of India, China, Japan, and America, which collectively represent 43% of the world's population and six times the population of the European Union. Would my right honourable friend agree with me? that this demonstrates the potential for a prosperous and positive future for Britain yeah. post-Brexit, yeah, 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 yeah. and it really is time for the pessimists to look at the cup being half full rather than half empty. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm happy to endorse my uh, honourable friend's approach and, and just to emphasise him, to him and the House that it's really important to do both. We need a good trade deal with the European Union. It is still a hugely important uh, trading partner for us. But also we need to take the opportunity to strike trade deals with economies around the world, not just currently uh, advanced economies, but those that are growing uh, very fast as well. That's the route to future global prosperity for this country. Yeah. Judith Cummins. We've had two general elections where the government has promised investment for the Northern Powerhouse and yet again, within weeks, they U-turn yep. on the Trans-Pennine yep. electrification. Yep. Is the £1 billion deal with the BUP to keep the PM in power being funded at the expense of investment in Bradford and the North? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, not at all. The, uh, the money uh, that has gone for infrastructure in Northern Ireland is uh, richly needed there. Uh, we have signed, for example, city deals in England, Scotland and Wales, but none yet uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and I would hope, I mean, she is right about the importance uh, of the Northern Powerhouse, uh, and, and we will continue uh, with that programme, which is hugely important. And as she's already heard uh, in this session, uh, what we see is unemployment falling consistently in the north of England as a sign of how the economy in that part of England is going as well as anywhere else in the country, and we are determined to continue that. Uh, Mr Speaker, I know that the First Secretary will be delighted to see that Parliament Square now displays every flag of every British overseas territory yeah. to welcome the King of Spain this week, including the flag of Gibraltar. <laughs> Would he ask my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, to remind the King of Spain that Gibraltar is British and their sovereignty will remain paramount. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to assure my uh, honourable friend that the government's position on Gibraltar uh, and the primacy of the wishes of its inhabitants, which are overwhelmingly to stay British, will be respected by the government. McFadden. Mr. Speaker, what assessment has the government made of the effect on radiotherapy for cancer patients of its decision to withdraw from Euratom, given that the Royal College of Radiologists said this week that half a million scans a year are done using imported radioisotopes and that thousands of patients could be affected by this decision. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I am genuinely, again, happy to answer this question because it is a very important issue and there has been some unnecessary worry caused to cancer patients by speculating on this. Let me set out the position. The import or export of medical radioisotopes is not subject to any particular Euratom licensing requirements. Euratom places no restrictions on the export of medical isotopes to countries outside the EU. So after leaving 
Euratom, our ability to access medical isotopes produced in Europe will not be affected. So I hope that clears up and I hope that reassures cancer patients around the country that the scaremongering that's going on is unnecessary.